Today I want to read to you from one of my favorite books. Ha, who are we kidding? Not one of my favorite books, my favorite book, period. It's called To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Have you ever heard of it? How many of y'all have ever read it? How many of you have seen the movie? How many of you have seen the movie and the book, read the book? How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Okay. Y'all will get there. You'll get there. Um, <clears throat> my mother-in-law taught English Lit for years and uh, told me at one point that she had taught it every year. It was just, it was part of the curriculum every year um, they read this book. But growing up in South Carolina, it was never assigned to me. I didn't read it until I was in seminary. I don't, I don't know why that is. If you're familiar with the book, you can probably draw some inferences maybe. Um, maybe it was considered pinko commun communist literature. I don't know, but um, I've enjoyed it. It's one of my favorites. So I'm going to read to you um, from a scene early on in the book where Scout Finch, who's the kind of the protagonist, the narrator of the story, she narrates as an adult, but in the story she's about six years old when we start. And she and her older brother Jim and her father Atticus are sitting down to lunch one day. Uh, they've come home from school for lunch. And Jim has invited a little boy named Walter Cunningham to come home and have lunch with them. Now, Walter comes from even more humble background than they do. Lives on a farm out in the county. His parents don't have much money. The reason he was invited home to lunch with them is because he did not have a lunch of his own. His parents couldn't afford to send one and certainly didn't have money to give him to go buy lunch. So he is sitting at table with Atticus and Jim and Scout for lunch. <clears throat> While Walter piled food on his plate, he and Atticus talked together like two men to the wonderment of Jim and me. Atticus was expounding upon farm problems when Walter interrupted to ask if there was any molasses in the house. Atticus summoned Calpurnia, who returned bearing the syrup pitcher. She stood waiting for Walter to help himself. Walter poured syrup on his vegetables and meat with a generous hand. He would probably have poured it into his milk glass had I not asked what in the Sam Hill he was doing. The silver saucer clattered when he replaced the pitcher, and he quickly put his hands in his lap and then ducked his head. Atticus shook his head at me again. But he's gone and drowned his dinner in syrup, I protested. He poured it all over. It was then that Calpurnia requested my presence in the kitchen. She was furious, and when she squinted down at me, the tiny lines around her eyes deepened. There's some folks who don't eat like us, she whispered fiercely, but you ain't called on to contradict them at the table when they don't. That boy's your company, and if he wants to eat up that tablecloth, you let him. Do you hear? By commenting on Walter's choices at the dinner table, Scout had made a serious breach of the rules of hospitality. Calpurnia rightfully points out that being a good host means that if a guest wants to eat that tablecloth, you let him. But it's also worth pointing out that as a guest at someone else's table, you should never eat the tablecloth. <laughs> <clears throat> you see, while the rules of hospitality govern the behavior of a host, as Scout has learned the hard way, the rules of etiquette govern the behavior of guests. And if you're a guest in someone else's house, you are expected to act right. Our New Testament lesson this morning gives us a biblical example of this very idea. The man in Jesus' parable has been invited in off the street to a wedding banquet for the son of the king. Like the other poor folks of, who've been invited in off the street <clears throat> to take the place of the more illustrious guests who declined the invitation, this man is not dressed appropriately for such an affair. Now, some would argue that he was invited in from the street with no advance notice, so of course he isn't dressed properly. But apparently, the other guests either found the proper clothing or were given it by the hosts, as was often the custom at weddings of the time. But this man makes no effort to change his clothes or find something appropriate for the occasion. Whether this is the result of blissful ignorance or flagrant arrogance is unclear, but the result is the same. He enjoys the hospitality of his host while meeting none of the demands of common etiquette. Tom Long describes the scene this way. He writes, The other guests humbly, quietly trade in their street clothes for the festive wedding garments of worship and celebration. But there he is, bellying up to the punch bowl, stuffing his mouth with fig preserves, wiping his hands on his white t-shirt. 
This man has been welcomed into the great banquet hall of the Lamb of God, but he's acting as if he's grazing at the happy hour buffet in his local pool hall. In Matthew's telling, <clears throat> the parable becomes an allegory. The king represents God, while the son is the bride, the bridegroom represents Jesus. The marriage feast is the great feast of which Matthew writes back in chapter 8. Many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The slaves sent out to bring in the guests are the prophets of Israel, while the ones who turn down the invitation are the people of Israel who refuse to listen. The gathering of the outsiders to come as replacement guests represents the evangelical mission of the early church, and the wedding call can be seen as, or the wedding hall can be seen as the church itself. Early hearers and readers of Matthew's gospel would have understood the code and would have gotten Matthew's message. The chosen people of Israel have rejected God's messengers, and now the gates of the kingdom are being thrown wide open to those who were previously left standing on the outside looking in. This is the picture of God's grace, that those who have no reason to be included in the sumptuous feast of the Lamb find themselves invited in, not because they deserve to be invited, but simply because God wants them there. But once invited, the guests still have a responsibility to observe the rules of etiquette. They should dress and act accordingly. That's why you shouldn't get too concerned about how unfair the host was for throwing the poor fellow out that didn't have the right wedding attire on. This story isn't about the host, it's about the guest. You see, the story is not meant to teach outsiders about God's grace. It's meant to teach insiders, those folks already in the early church, how to react in the presence of God's grace. And that's where the garment comes in. In Matthew's telling of Jesus' allegorical parable, the garment that is required is the one the author of Colossians describes later on in the New Testament. In chapter 3 of Colossians, we find these words. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, Clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. These are the garments appropriate for the banquet feast of God. For Matthew, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not just about receiving the gifts of grace. It is about responding to that gift with lives lived reflecting that grace of God into the world. This is what Jesus means when he says earlier in Matthew's gospel, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And it's why Matthew's Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son, yes, to emphasize grace for the lost prodigal, but also to point out the challenge to the older brother who stays at home, follows the rules, and does what's expected of him. Matthew's Jesus underscores the response to grace that's required of the insiders. We get wrapped up in the good news of the gospel, and for good reason. The comfort of the knowledge of God's grace and mercy and steadfast love is a powerful thing. But here Jesus points out that the gospel message is also a challenge because it requires us to respond accordingly. It requires us to meet the hospitality of our hosts with a life lived as a guest in God's house observing the rules of etiquette. <clears throat> Today marks the beginning of our annual stewardship campaign at Overbrook Church. You might have noticed the special snacks out in the narthex before worship today, the decorations on the front door. You may have received a letter asking you to consider your pledge, and if you have not, you will. Stewardship season is our annual rite in the church, a tradition that some greet with a groan and a sense of despair People don't like to talk about money sometimes, and frankly, there are people who are suspicious about the church and their appeal for it. But scripture constantly reminds us, as it does today, that being a disciple comes with blessings and responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities is appropriately responding to God's blessings with our lives. Over the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing a lot about stewardship, 
There will be times when you are asked to consider your financial support of this church. There will be times when you are asked to consider the talents that you have and the ways that you can use those talents to serve the kingdom of God. There will be times when you are asked to think about your daily life and the way that you apportion your hours and minutes and days to see if there might be some way that you can give some of your time to God by serving God's people. But in the final analysis, we have all been invited to a sumptuous banquet where there's ample food and drink for everyone there. And you've been invited to the table for no other reason than that the host loves you and wants you to be there. You can pour molasses all over your dinner if you want to. You can eat up that tablecloth if you choose. The hospitality of your host reflects the height and depth of God's love for each of you. But you've also been placed under the demands of etiquette, the expectation that you will respond to the gracious hospitality of your host in an appropriate manner. What we're being asked to do is to consider how we might show our appreciation for such an undeserved invite by responding in ways that glorify God and give honor for the blessings with which God has filled our lives to overflowing. What you're being asked to do is to join your host in that sumptuous feast. But whatever you do, please don't eat the tablecloth. To God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come. Amen.